hockey. Yeah. Yeah. My favorite. It's Judd's Hockey Show. It is Judd's Hockey Show. Welcome in. Judd, A.J. Fredrickson is so often the case. Um, and I'm just right now, A.J., calling the National Hockey League standings up because obviously there is very little time left and the Wild is probably pretty hopelessly behind. What's interesting is the Blues somehow got shut out by the Sharks last night. I watched a part of that game. They were awful. The the Blues were absolutely atrocious. And then the Kings lost to the Flames. So currently the Wilds played 73 games. Uh, They have 79 points. Blues have played 74 games. They have 82 points. So they, they remained three up. And then the Kings... 87 points in 73 games, which is the same amount as the Wild. So the Wild right now remains as they were going into yesterday, eight points back of a playoff spot. And you might be saying, how is that? They got an over, they got into o- overtime. What about that loser point? Well, age, we watched the game together. And for the second time in the past 20 days, uh, John Hines decided to pull his goaltender in overtime to try to get a second point without it going to a shootout. He actually had a lot of reasoning for that at his postgame presser. Empty net goal by the uh, by the Golden Knights. They win it two to one. Let me first off say, and we talked about this a few times. Thoroughly entertaining game. Like if that had yeah. been the story of this, if the story of the Wild season had been games like this that were close defeats against good teams, I think I'd be much more optimistic about the 2023-24 campaign. How about you? Yeah, yesterday, I mean, it was it was refreshing. Like they it, it was a I'm trying to recall exactly like the timeline of goals because it was a zero zero game end of one, if mm-hmm. I am correct in that uh, recollection. And then it sure. wasn't until I, I mean, it was a back and forth game. And then it was a I want to say, was it a power play goal? Yeah, five minute uh, major on Eichel during the, yeah, the Eichel spike uh, spearing that uh, he got ejected for was the first goal of the game. And I think I turned to you and I was like, I think they're <laughs> they're going to win this game. They didn't, they were playing a very complete game. They were like very nuisance some of, of Vegas. Um, there was at one point um, a, a Vegas power play before Eichel did get ejected. And I, I think we both shared that he was too quiet up until that point. Mm-hmm. The Wild defensively yesterday played a very solid game in a like Minnesota Wild branded defensive hockey which i feel like we maybe haven't seen in a long time because they really played a great game all around um the problem there and is that they they get that lead and this was brought up to Hines in his post game presser which is they just haven't been able to close out games and maybe put their foot down on the neck of the opponent a lot of times this year so that comes back to bite them they go to the overtime session and i'm i know we'll talk about uh the decision to pull the goalie but to your point, yes. Yesterday's game was very, very pleasant to watch. I left the I left the X feeling like you know I I necessarily didn't have to uh, pay for the ticket of admission, but right. the and, you know everybody there I think left despite the loss, saying that was a fun hockey game and you appreciated it for what it was, which was two teams playing quality hockey for three and some change periods. Yeah, here's the stat that, that you just uh, t- uh, talked about, c- courtesy of our friend. Michael Russo of The Athletic. Uh, since December 31st, the Wild have blown seven third period leads all at home. They are 0 3 and 4 in those games for uh, 11 lost points in, in the standings um, because the fourth tonight came in overtime with the goaltender pulled. And let's get to that. So, this was the second time, and we talked about this. We had an inkling, as I think the entire building did, that if this thing got to OT at some point, John Hines was going to pull the goaltender. Uh, 20 days ago against Nashville in a game that Boldy ended with, I think, a nice pass from Zuccarello to beat the Predators. That was Flurry in goal. This time it was Gustafson in goal who got pulled. And, and we'll talk about this as well. Gus played great again. Gus has, like, turned mm-hmm. things around for now. Now we can discuss that. But anyway, um, what did you – I guess I got two questions for you. One, what did you think of the move? And I guess, two, more importantly – what did you think about when it was done? Because we both threw out in the press box that because there'd be zero element of surprise this time, that it might be a better idea to do it in the third period because either way, you're forfeiting the point. So it's not like get to overtime, get the point. Once the goaltender goes in overtime, that point's gone. So they're really, other than bodies on the ice, 
there's no difference in deciding to do it at the end of the third or in the OT. Uh, firstly, on the move, I, I'm a fan of it. I'm, you're at the point of the season where if you're still in your mind saying we have a chance to make the playoffs, we need these points, you have to do, you have to do all means necessary, and that is, in their case, pulling the goalie when it probably isn't um, an expected thing. The problem there, and this is what you touched on as well, is that the whole building, and that's including that Golden Knights bench, because it was um, uh, Bruce Cassidy and his post game presser told Michael Russo as well that, but after the uh, after regulation before the overtime session, he talked on the bench and said, "Hey, we know they've done this before. Something we we, we might want to keep an eye on." Lo and behold, they do. They're kind of ready for it. And this is where John Hines said in his post game presser, which was it was kind of more about the matchup. And it, I, I feel like, I feel like the element of surprise trumps matchup in this scenario, 10 out of 10 times. Um, when, when they did pull Gustafson, they had Marsha. So who actually got the eventual winner um, for Vegas, he doesn't kill penalties. And that was one of the reasoning. And I get it. You know, it, I, I under, I understand his reasoning and thought process here, but that that's where I disagree where you pulling the goalie buck wild two minutes, minute 30 minute left in the third catches them so much more off guard than let's, let's just hope that we get the right set of circumstances in the overtime session. And, you know, Marco Rossi goes from the offensive corner all the way does a, you know, a lap around his own net. And now we've killed some more time and, you know, they're now they're expecting it. They, they know it's probably coming at some point here. And now we're finally going to get our, um, our guys out there and, and set things up. End of the third is when, if you're going to do it, which I think you need to, and you should have done it. Um, the, the only question there's how much time I said, I think to you, like minute 30, because yeah. you, you, 90 seconds. you want to, you want to give yourself a little bit of time. Don't get like set it up and look for yeah. an opportunity to pass the puck around, set up the offensive zone. But, Absolutely. um, not too much to where it's just going to be an easy steal and in, in ice a couple times for, for, for Vegas. So um, that's where I disagree with John Hines, but I do understand where his thought process was matchup. Yeah. I, I just think element of surprise. You've done it already. The playbook is out. People know about it. Bruce Cassidy knew about it. He told his team, you gave them a break to, to reconsider and recollect and, and uh, just kind of regroup before the overtime session. That's in, that's in their, their playbook. Everybody knows that you've done that now. I think that I think what you just said is exactly right because I think it's far far more important than who might kill and who might not kill. Um, so it's so the skill out there for the, the Golden Knights. The the play was Zuccarello shot. Um, the goal the goaltender Logan Thompson makes the save. Carlson Wild Bill, who's a hell of a player, picks up the puck, feeds Marsha Show who then scores, I think, from or behind his own blue line. But the fact is, the skill out there was so great. Like, I, I don't think, in my opinion, it's it's the matchups are the matchups. But, you know, now if I catch the Golden Knights fourth line on there, and they're, but, but three on three is always high skill. So I think three on three becomes a wash because you never have your really crappy guys out, out there. And I know you could say, well, but they don't PK – and I would say, well, yeah, they don't PK, but they're really damn good. And you're playing pond hockey right now. I, I, I was there. The Predators game. The Predators were like, what the f? Like, like that's because they're like, whoa, what are you doing? You know, what just happened? Um, and in this case, totally prepared, which is why I thought that your point rings true. On if you do it at the end of the third, it might they might have said, oh, we didn't expect it yet, and now they're caught a little bit flat footed. Advantage you so. Um, all of that being said, though, I've tried to think like, should this, is there something to be upset about here? You know, he had to, cause you know, John Hines did have to answer and, and good for the reporters. He had to answer a bunch of questions about it. And I just can't be, I like the move. What the hell you're, you're basically dead. Um, try something like this. Like, I feel like this is the type of thing that Dean never would have done. And it would, and, and if you saw another team do this, you'd be frustrated about why doesn't Dean do that? Right. So, yeah, I just had no problem with it. The timing might not have been, in our opinion, the best, but it's still, that's not a reason to like draw a line in the sand and, and be like, well, it worked once, so we'll never do, do that again. Um, let's get on to the second thing. As the game came to an end, um, we both saw a stick fly across the ice. Mm -hmm. I think it came from the bench. 
Ryan Hartman, who had been high sticked right before the overtime, late in the third, um, in the face, and it definitely could have been called, was upset. And so he launched his stick. And I don't think from my from our viewpoint in the press box, which is not a perfect line from where the stick came, because we're we're aligned, our seats are across from the visitors bench. Mm-hmm. Um, this was from the the home bench. But from what I could see, that stick definitely flew past an official to the point of where the officials were very cognizant of that. Uh, Brendan Blandina, Garrett Rank, who did not have a good day, to be very clear. They had a lousy day. Um, the Eichel Spear, which was a good call, came after they, they missed a Kaprizov cross-check on Eichel, which precipitated then the payback. That's no excuse for a spear, but the fact is they missed that call. Eric Sinek at one point was tripped. They totally missed it. They missed a bunch of stuff. And for either side to be to to say, well, they screwed us, bleep off. I don't want to hear it. Like, I don't want to hear your th- these things all even out in the end. Uh Kaprizov got away with a cross check. If Kaprizov doesn't get away with a cross check and they call it, but they called a couple of penalties uh on the Golden Knights right before that, then Eichel doesn't deliver the spear and Eichel plays in that entire game. So, but the fact of the matter is, I understand why why Hartman was upset, but hear me out, because this is what frustrates me. He's going to have a hearing tomorrow. He's been suspended, I believe, twice already this season, if that's correct. Um, and he is going to get fined for sure. He might get suspended, but he is not good enough to play on the edge and ever cross it. Like, he's doing Marchand type of crap here. Brad Marchand, who who by, who by the way has cleaned things up. Now he's a captain now, so he probably has to. Yeah. But you know <laughs> he's pulling these stunts where it's like, dude, you're not good enough. You don't. First of all, you cannot throw your stick near an official. That's just stupid. Um, you can go complain to him all all you want and whine and cry. I don't care about that. But second of all, it's my humble opinion that it comes of it comes a point where if he's going to pull these stunts. And, and, you know, the suspensions are warranted. What he's done. I can't have that on my team because he would have to be damn near a star player for me to tolerate that. And he is he is ultimately a bottom six guy. So he needs to clean it up or I don't want him. He, he becomes, in my opinion, AJ, a liability. Right now, is it like, like is he the wild card in the deck where you, you kind of know what he is, but also at the same time, like you're saying he's a liability where you, you might put yourself in a spot. Let, let, let's, let's just play a game of hypotheticals, th- hypotheticals here. What if the sure. wild were not in their spot? What if they were a team that started off the season a lot better and they are holding on to one of the final two wild card spots, right? And this is an even higher leverage game because the wild, don't have a 2% chance of making them play. They have a 75% chance, but it's going to drastically go down if they lose this game to the Golden Knights and all this other stuff. And then same thing, a childish, let's whip our stick across the ice because I got hit and they, 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 they didn't see it. And now, hey, everybody's out to get us. Now you've put your team in a bad spot where you are, I would say, in this lineup, a pretty key guy based on like how the structure of the line's you know, work out. Do I think he's like uh, the base pillar? No, but he is certainly a part of the building. Right. And he's, he's a, he's a, he's a part of the building that, you know, people, he's the door, everybody walks through him. And I don't mean that as like a defensive thing, just like he's, he's used quite a bit. Right. Yes. He's yes. But now he can be important. Now you're, yeah. Now you're facing repercussions. Now you have a meeting with the department of player safety. Now you have um, now you have possible reprimands where you might be out honestly you probably will get uh, a game or two or three here and now you're in a spot where your team still needs those points still needs these games here in the final what eight ish of the season yep and now you're no longer there for three of them against right. either no matter where you look at it let's say it's lesser opponents they're going to need you for that because those should be games that you need to help secure that playoff spot right or it's higher leverage games once again you have the, the, you have the Vegas Golden Knights. Um, you have the Colorado Avalanche coming up. T- good teams that you're going to need your best lineup for. And I think out of what the Wild have on their w- roster right now, Ryan Harmon fits into that best roster or that best lineup. So 
Um, you, you've removed yourself from the situation because you couldn't walk to the back hall and smash your stick against an uh, inanimate object. Or have the team. Yeah, and and you know what? Bill Guerin can call the league this morning. And mm-hmm. but but my point is like he would have to be a guy that consistently scores 35 goals to put up with this and and to hope to rein it back in. He's yeah. making himself a liability. Uh and by by the way, he's been suspended, it looks like three times. The last time was in November, according to uh according to Russo here. So anyway, my yeah, I think he can be a piece. I, I personally think he ideally is a bottom six piece of the puzzle. And I think he definitely has a role, but I also think that if he's going to make himself a liability and I mean, throwing your stick at an official is about the most childish, immature. Um, it's not going to help you with officials across the board. I mean, these are like it or not. These are spiteful people. Referees are spiteful people. I know you're going to be shocked to hear that from me, but <laughs> they are. And, and you know, you're right. If you were barely holding on to a playoff spot, the last thing that you need is for every official, because these guys are buddies around the league, to be looking for 38 to do something, right? So I just, this needs to stop now. This needs to, this crap needs to stop now. He needs to, it's one thing to be fiery. And again, I he needs he might be a guy that needs to, and I think he probably does play on the edge. He has no room to cross that edge. Mm-hmm. He has no room to like step over that line. And he's done that and it hurts this team. And and this was just another, you know, display. A lot of guys have gotten screwed on calls. A lot of guys. Officiating in all sports is far from perfect. But to launch your stick across the ice, um, in by by the way, in a season in which you have no one to blame, but yourselves for the most part. I can't have that. Uh, talking point three, let's talk about this one. Philip Gustafson, his play of late, AJ Fredrickson. Um, last five games. And and now this is a little bit frustrating because the Wild coaching staff had to pull Gus in and sort of challenge him late in the season to play better. And this is a little bit Johansson-like, although I, I have a special place in my heart for my disdain for what he's done. Um, but they had to pull him in and then he started to work harder in practice because he wasn't working harder in practice. Anyway, last five games, the good news is 963 save percentage. He's made 130 saves on 135 shots against last five games, had the shutout against the Ducks. So he has given up five goals, five goals in five games, 963. That's really, really good. Solid, right, H? Yeah. The five games before that, the improvement has been this. 857 save percentage, 114 saves on 133 shots against. Number one, I think that this, this spurt is great. Gives me more incentive to take him to market. Um, I have serious questions, though, about this. Like, it's one thing if he just said, oh, you know, I was really playing poor. Nothing's changed, but I was really playing poor. Mm -hmm. But this whole having to challenge a player in the midst of when you're supposed to be in a playoff race and for him to button down, I find interesting. I'm, I'm not indicting him necessarily. I find it intriguing. But at least what we've seen the last five games, and yes, you shut out the Ducks as like, okay, slow clap. But I believe this started, he played really well in that OT loss to the Avs. Uh, I thought he was very good yesterday. Heck, that Sharks game where the Wild took a powder and he actually played well when he shouldn't have had to. Um, This is the guy that we were far more expecting to see. My question is, why do you have to incentivize and challenge your supposed number one goaltender? This this was the plan. Philip Gustafson, 1G. He is your go-to. He is your rock. Sure. To to paraphrase the... (laughs) The, the Herb Brooks, oh, you got a bad Bruce. Oh, so you had a bad couple of games. Cry me a river. You know, you know what a, yeah. a, a real 1G does? A, a real number one goaltender? You think Andre Vasilevsky or a um, Connor Hellebuck, you know what they do? They work a little harder. They watch more tape. They, they spend a couple extra hours in the rink this week working on stuff to get themselves back to the level that they know where they can play. And this is the level that I think we all know that Phil Gustin is able to play at because we've seen him – kind of slowly come into that to the season. He's done that now two years in a row. We saw yep. the drop off and now, Hey, you know, you got a challenge way to go. Why? I just don't understand why we have to 
talk to him about this? Why are, why are we not? I, everybody knows the whole, you practice like you play, you, you play like you practice or, right. you know, it's the same thing either way. Yeah. If you're not trying hard in practice as the number one goaltender, yeah, you're probably not going to be too hot when you're playing against the best hockey players in the world on a night to night basis. I'd like to know a little bit more about this whole yeah. thing. Like I'd, I'd like to know, cause Hey, look, all goaltenders slump. That's not a surprise. Oh, not, no, um, no question. It, it feels to me though, like his season has been very up and down. Like, mm-hmm. like, like if he went through a rough five game stretch and that was the only rough stretch, I'd be like, okay, that's going to happen. I'm not going to be too hard on him. But one, it feels like the consistency that we saw after rough star start last year, that consistency has been gone. And I would like to know a little bit more, you know, because basically if you've got to go get the flower, God bless the flower. But if you got to go get him and dust him off from the mothballs and be like, you are our one G for now. Because Gus can't stop a, or Gus can't catch a cold, and then you got to call Gus in and talk to him, and then Gus comes back, and um, that to me is a guy I think I'd like to trade, because I need, yeah. I need in 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 a season like this, I need more overall consistency. Like there's no use in having a goaltender who's going to be up and down. It's going to drive you crazy. Hopefully Volstead's not that, and and that's why I am a proponent of Flurry helping. Volstead, because the first year in the National Hockey League might be difficult. But I just have a lot of questions about, like, what's gone on with Gus's year. Um, I mean, I think it was probably fair to question him immediately being granted a three-year contract. Uh, But without passing judgment completely, I mean, I am am leaning towards, if you can trade him, I think I would probably try and trade him. And the last five games have substantiated a guy who you could sell to a team as possibly a number one goaltender for 2024-25. Yeah, because uh, this is the – it's the change of scenery. It's the, And like you said, I have questions. And that's where maybe the one position in hockey that I don't want to have a lot of questions from, I think if you have your number one goaltender, the guy that you can rely on, it should be the – you know, if, if you play fantasy football, the one – you know, when you draft Justin Jefferson, set and forget. He's he's in your lineup every yeah. week. There's no there's no debate, no matter the, the matchup. Right. Same thing for Gus. Like you're you're playing two out of three. You're you know you're gonna play against the better teams. Like we know you're gonna go in there and Frank. You know, you're gonna have a bad night. That's yeah, expected 100%. because that's just naturally how how people are. You're not gonna be on your A game every single night. But with how up and down the roller coaster of this season for him, I'm left with a lot of questions and I have no. Um, I have no quarrel with him. I like, he seems like a great guy and everything, but when it comes to the future of the position, when I know that the wild have a guy waiting in the wings, like Wallstead, yeah. it makes it a lot easier for me to say, I don't think you are the, the wild's mainstay goaltender into next year. I would rather have that be more of a mentorship with flurry and Wallstead if flower is uh, willing to come back for one more season. It feels a little bit like back to, to the future Devin Dubnik 2.0 to me. You know, because you get the brilliant game and then you get the brilliant moments and all of a sudden a goal hits off the scoreboard, the bench hits a guy in the head, doink, goes off his breezer and it goes in and you're like, what What was that? And Dubnik's never the same the whole rest of the night, right? It feels like, and like last night, Gus, and I I mentioned this to you and this is purely observational. So I, I bring you no data, no statistics, no analytics to back up what I'm about to say. But it feels like when Gus, until Gus lets in that first goal, he is pretty damn good. And he didn't allow it till what, 318, 317 left in the game yesterday. So he had a really good game. But it feels like that first goal, like something happens. It's And, and it's like the one thing I want next year across the board, because too many wild teams have completely lacked this and it's the easiest thing, but it's consistency. I got to have more consistency. I got to have more consistency from players. I got to have more consistency from uh, the goaltending, from defensemen. I want to know what I'm going to get. And I feel like, they're, you know what? Brock Faber is a bedrock of consistency. It's I think it's the reason why I like him the most. Because and, and when Spurgeon was healthy and good, he was pretty consistent. Brodeen is consistent. Um, I need that. I need that consistency. And it feels like that is very fleeting. Except for this guy, who, by the way, the guy I'm about to mention, I think we did a couple of JHS episodes on his start, which, which was not great. Now, he was banged up and hurt. And and I do think, I think Jesse Pierce might have talked about this. Kirill Kaprizov, um, who was 
folded up like an organ by Logan Stanley in Winnipeg last season and, and was hurt, came back for the playoffs, was never the same, and then spent, I think, the off season or a good portion of it, AJ, recovering, uh, got back for training camp, and then it took him a long time, or it felt like a long time. I'll stop. It felt like a long time to become himself again. Going through his numbers, and he scored his 37th goal of the game yesterday. Kirill Kaprizov, in 66 games now, has 37 goals, 45 assists, 82 points, and is a plus 13. Last year, because of the injury in the regular season, he played in 67 games, so one more game. Um, and he finished with 40 goals, 35 assists, 75 points. He has seven more points right now, and he was only a plus four. Let me give you the splits, though, here, because this is when, and I think what this is, is just a clear indication of when he started to feel good. I don't think he flipped a switch on purpose. I would never accuse him of dogging it. I don't think he does. But in 34 games through December 30th, so as New Year's Eve approached, he had 13 goals, 34 points, five power play goals, shooting percentage 11.8, okay? So 13 goals, 34 points, 34 games. In 32 games since the turn of the year to 2024, so this is just since then, 24 goals, so 11 more goals, 24 assists, 48 points in 32 games. So two fewer games than I gave you for that, that start, Nine power play goals, and the shooting percentage in that time alone has skyrocketed to 19%. Um, I'd like to apologize, Kirill. Anything I said about you disappointing was purely the fact that you weren't healthy at that time. This guy is having a remarkable season. And I know it's not consistent, but I can explain the inconsistency a little bit more here. But I just feel it's worth paying homage to a guy who is just a bleeping superstar. I mean, he's everything that I think Minnesota Wild fans have like yearned for up until uh, making his debut against the Kings during that COVID season. Um, I mean, he he's just incredible. And now that we're finally seeing him back at his best, playing his best hockey, I mean, that that just goes to show. Like, I mean, I think we talked about. It, and I don't think either of us ever condemned like, oh, it was a flash in the pan type of thing. It was like something is clearly wrong. And right. now that we're past that and we're out of the woods and you can tell that he is comfortable again and he is pushing himself again, th- I'm excited for what maybe even next season is going to be because the word around this was during last off season, it was more rehab than actual training and progressing his game and building his game. So now you're back, assuming knocking on wood that nothing changes in the next eight games here. Mm-hmm that's what you're going to have this off season for the wild unless some miracle happens and they get to, to the playoffs and you know, whatever. But um, this, yeah, <laughs> because no, they're, I, I, because I they're still you. not, they're still not out of it, Judd. No, they're um, not. No, they're not. Um, but uh, I think, I think they would, and correct me if I'm wrong here, maybe the wild are almost doing him a disservice with their lack of depth. Because you look at some of these other teams with these other superstars. Oh, yeah. No, you're right. McDavid. Point. You look at Kucherov. You look at McKinnon. These guys are putting up these fantastic numbers. And the thing is, these teams, crazy, crazy to think about this. They have to worry about more than just them. They have to be concerned about other lines that they're playing against and not just that top line with McKinnon, that top line with McDavid and Dreisaitl, that top line with Kucherov. And so you're spreading the defense a little bit out more. Kirill Kaprizov, if they get a little depth behind him, he's going to have so much more space and room because teams are going to have to allocate their defensive assets right. against some of these other lines. Yeah. And and th- those teams, like those top lines are phenomenal. And the depth beat behind them is not always great. But, you know, in, in the case of the Avs, trade deadline move. Middle yes. stat. Mm-hmm. In the case of the Oilers, Henrik to plug in. You know, so like that's what you do when when you're about to pop. But I I think it's a good point because the thing about it is the Wilds' talent fall off after the top six is so great. And and you know this team has problems at times finishing beyond that top three. And that top three at times, short of Kaprizov, 
can struggle as well at times, but I mean, X got 30. That first line with Eck, Boldy, and Kaprizov, shout out to them. I mean, it has been absolutely, absolutely great. In, in fact, I think one of the one of the good things about this season, and especially the second half when, when Kirill has really taken off, is the fact that we've learned that Zuccarello is not imperative to Kirill's ascension. Like, they're still in the power play together. They're still big buddies. Not mm-hmm. saying they're they're not okay, but and and what was frustrating I thought yesterday, and this is one of the things I would have in my exit meetings for after the last game. How do you harness? And I know that you're not going to get this for 82 games, but how do you harness the boldy that we saw yesterday? Way more consistently when he plays like that, and he doesn't even have to score, um, but. The engagement level of that guy yesterday, and and we've seen it before, mm-hmm. when he is truly engaged. I'm not saying he's a star, but he's pretty damn good, man. And when he's not engaged, he's still okay. But the guy that we saw, I I thought yesterday was like you could tell that was a game that Boldy was up for, and there is a level of play there that screams he belongs on that line in a big way. That I mean, he's been. After after the no show game against I want to say the Blackhawks after the yep. All Star break they had that um, that sit down with him it sounds like and since then I mean sure he's had a couple stinkers here and there this goes games. back to the this goes back to the gold uh, the boldy or the the goldie thing with yep. they're gonna have some stinkers every now and again and that's expected that's yeah. just natural Correct. but for the most part there have been way more of those types of performances and yesterday might have been even in a loss in a game where he didn't. Like he didn't dazzle at times. Like you said, the engagement level was so high. You could tell like every loose puck, he was trying his hardest. The, some of the defensive plays, he had one where he kind of brought the puck into the offensive zone, tried to make a move and uh, his deke like made him go down, but he still stuck with the play and got back and helped on the defensive side, even though he turned the puck over. Right. There's the level that we've seen him play with the engagement and plus now, once again, like we know he had the skill, but he's applying both at the same time. Yep. It makes me nervous for the end of the season because it seems like it's clicking. We're clicking. It's it's snapping in. Oh, they've done a good job. Yeah. But now you're going to have this super long break between the end of the season and the start of next where you're going to have to either make sure that this sticks or get him geared up before the start of next season because I don't want this to go away. I want this to be a permanent a permanent thing for him. Part of being a pro though. Like that's it, being a pro. Like, like if he doesn't yes. come back to camp with that, then you got a problem. Yeah. Like, absolutely. like, like this is the difference with a guy like, and uh, you know, we we've discussed this before and we both made it very clear. This guy was not as good as Boldy, but you know, Greenway, mm-hmm. Greenway had Greenway had a style of play that when he was engaged, he, he could be really effective. He certainly changed games physical. He could score some goals, but he didn't play like that most of the time. And it eventually, you know, after chance, after chance, after chance, got him traded. So, um, yeah, I'm also curious about the political nature going into next season of Zuccarello not starting the year on Kaprizov's line. Because I do think, I think it's advantageous to have, well, I really like Ek Boldy Kaprizov. Um, And I, you know, I just don't think that Zuccarello makes Kaprizov go nearly as much as was thought. I'm also curious about the center. Are they going to leave Eck alone? If it was Dean, I would say he's not going to. Because it's John Hines and and he has done this for quite some time now, I think that he will. But I mean, make no mistake, when you look at the point production, you know, Kaprizov and Eck, it is fantastic. I mean, you know, Erickson Eck was a guy five years back where like Brock Bess or what a miss by Chuck Fletcher. And now he's got guys got what? 30 goals and Eric's next been great. Besser's still great as well, but now you know exactly why uh, Jules Erickson Eck was drafted by the wild. All right, sir. Great stuff. Thank you very much. Judd's hockey show back on Wednesday with Declan, perhaps AJ, Jesse Pierce. I don't know. It's a cast of thousands. We'll talk to you later.